Well, good morning. Welcome to 2020. <laughs> Welcome to 2021. Um, it's remarkable, isn't it, how not different 2021 is from 2020. You know, I think it's, I think it's somewhat humorous. I mean, there's certainly a lot of, there's a lot of hope that 2021 was going to be different. And maybe there still is, but um, why? Why, why? Why do we anticipate that 2021 was going to be any different? That, that somehow December 31st to January 1st, like this random date on a calendar that I, I don't even know, like Roman times, I think. Uh, you know, I don't know who, who built the calendar, but whoever it was, like it's arbitrary, it's completely arbitrary, and yet, and yet so much was banking on it, and, and it was like within a week, we we're like, yeah, the country is still just as divided, the world's still just as corrupt, sin is still present, where's the hope? Where's, where do we find our hope? And obviously I'm leading this, and I think you all are like, oh, our hope is in Jesus, which I hope that's what you're saying, but, but I, I really, like this morning, is we're, we're, we're getting into Judges, BJ preached last week um, and, and, and led us off with this. But what we're going to see this morning is that, that we have the solution. Like we, we have the solution to this division. We, we really do. It's the gospel. And, and I, I'm curious, like, like really think about that. Do you believe that? Because that's really what, what all of this is about. And what we spend our time thinking and, and praying and, and doing is, is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, actually solves problems, actually provides us with a living hope, Scripture calls it. A hope not just in our eternal destiny, but a hope in now. A hope in tomorrow. A hope that these waves of chaos and this division that somehow we can live through that and, and reflect Christ in that and present the joy that we have in Christ to this divided world. I mean, here's the reality, right? Like, let's say, I mean, I don't know, find a solution. We all think we have a solution. But here's what's interesting. Whatever your solution is, is not a solution for somebody else. You agree? Like, you may have solved everything, but there is somebody who's going to think that your solution is not a solution and is part of the problem. And those people think that they probably have a solution, right? And, and so there's no right answer. And, and that's the whole point, right? It's like inside of this world, there is no source of hope. There is no way that we are ever going to find hope by a temporal solution, by a solution in a person or a solution in material things or a solution in anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to see this morning, is that, that there was a generation, Joshua, when he, God, God allows them to enter the promised land, this promise that had been waiting, in, you know, like, like it had been kind of on the edge, and they didn't know when they were going to get to the promised land, and they finally get in there, and like BJ talked about last week, they didn't do what God wanted them to do, right? Like, like he wanted them to be separate and to, to kind of cast off the, the idolatry and the sin that was in that land. And he wanted them to be separate, but what they do? They went, well, it's okay. They can, they can be here with us. We just won't engage in that. We can be close to sin. We just won't get burned by it. And we saw that that does not work. It did not work. This week, we're going to look at the why. why. Why did this happen? And in particular, it's not so much Joshua and, and those. It's actually the generation after them that we see fall miserably. And that the rest of the book of Judges is going to walk us through. So we're going to be in Judges chapter 2. We're going to start off in verse 6. Before we do that, let me uh, pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Like Warner said, God, we, we want to worship you. We want our eyes to be cast on you and nothing else. Um, 
God, would you please speak through your word this morning? You record this for us. You preserve this for us so that you could warn us and caution us and remind us of who you are and the things that you do. I pray that this morning, Father, that that, that would just be present in our minds. That this is yours written, your letter written to us for a purpose. Father, motivate us today. Help us to rejoice in the good news. Knowing that you love us. Allow our souls to sing to you as we read through scripture and as we study you. And we are just in awe of who you are. In the name of your son we pray. Amen. So we're in Judges chapter 2 verse 6. And the, the verse will be on the screen. I'll be reading from the ESV. It says, when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord and all, sorry, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And what was that? That was, that was coming out of Egypt, that was going into the promised land, right? That was the great work that they were talking about. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Hares, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gosh. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he gave them over to plunderers, who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. The last part of that we're going to connect in towards next week's. But what I want you to get out of that is from verse 11, you probably have a paragraph break there, but from verse 11 to verse 15, we see the the result of this. And it actually even says that God swore to them what was going to happen. He's like, I told you this was what was going to happen. Now I I have to keep what I told you I was going to do. And so so he does. And we're going to see this beautiful picture of the gospel next week as as we continue to read on. But I want you to look in there and see, could you find the why? Why did that happen? It says that Joshua and those that outlived him, they served the Lord. And then what does it say? In verse 10, and another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord. So let's think about this here for a second. What, what does he mean by that word no? Because they're in the land. They walked into the land. They, they, were, right? they were the kids. They were the generation that followed Joshua, who lived to be 110 years old. We're not talking about 900 years of, of, of age at this point. We're talking about like the next generation. Like I don't know. They were playing hopscotch out in, in, you know, uh, outside of Israel, and then they walked inside Israel, and they were playing hopscotch the next day, and they're like, I guess this is the land of milk and honey that my parents were talking about, right? So they knew where they were at. So it's not that they didn't know what God had promised. It says that they didn't know the Lord. That know is relational. And we, we use that term in English. It's horrible because it kind of means the same thing. But, but like, there's a depth to that knowledge. It's something more than this. It's not just facts. It's not just information. There's actually a, uh, there's actually a, a similar story in 1 Samuel. If you've heard of Eli, 
not the book of Eli, it's, although that's a good movie. Um, but like uh, Eli, he's, he's a priest in the temple, and he's actually the one that uh, blesses Hannah, who ends up birthing Samuel, right? And so you can read about him in 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel 2.12, he is a priest. His sons are priests in the temple with him. And in verse 12, it says that he served, but his sons, they were wicked. Can you go forward to 1 Samuel 2.12 for me? I think it's in there. Maybe not. It says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. Some versions might say reckless, some corrupt. They were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. They're serving in the temple. And it goes on to explain, like, like, these guys were serving in the temple. They knew who Yahweh was. They knew the facts, but they didn't know him personally. And so we have to ask ourselves, like, there is, there is a very significant burden. This whole country, arguably a good portion of the world, knows who Jesus is. So why, why is there a question? <laughs> right? it's, not, it's not a matter of facts. It's a matter of a relationship. It's a matter of knowing who God is. So we have this example of these Faithful, this faithful generation, Joshua and the elders, and, and they trusted God and they had a relationship with God, and yet the generation that followed them did not. This should weigh heavy on us. And, and just so I'm clear here, like this is not speaking to just parents. This is, this is a problem of discipleship across the entire generation of Joshua and the elders. What did they not do? What did they fail to accomplish? I mean, they, may, they must have had incredible relationships with God. And yet, this next generation completely forsook all of those things that Joshua and the elders had prioritized in their life. I don't know about you, but for me, that's crushing. That's scary. And, and, and we got to be careful because we know that God is sovereign, right? And, we've, and we fall back to that and we go, you know what? Listen, I know that God is sovereign and he's in charge and, and he's a better father to my kids than I am any day of the week. And so I take comfort in that. But there's still some responsibility we all have as whether we've got grown children or young children or whether we don't have any children at all and we have coworkers and family and friends that, that know Jesus. They know of Jesus. They probably even know generally what you believe or they think they know what you believe. And this generation moves out and we see what is happening outside. We see the division. They don't know Jesus. Church, we don't know Jesus if we are as divided as the outside is. That's the reality. And our kids, our kids are growing up in this, right? And they see this, and they're being fed into this same pit of social media, of information, of division and anger and angst and frustration and fighting. And they're going to think that this is normal. What do we expect to have happen? If you ever read through Jeremiah and Lamentations, man, those are just some miserably sad books. And Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he was weeping over Israel. Effectively, the church now, right? Like he's weeping over it because he's going, you're, you're forsaking God. You're, you're getting caught up in everything that's going on. And that's exactly what that generation did. Like, like maybe they were excited. <laughs> they were moving into a new location. <laughs> but if we're getting caught up in these things, what's the message that we're sending to those outside? That, that, that their division, like we're just in the mix of all of this th these things too, and our hope is in these things? This isn't a problem of parenting. 
This isn't a success or failures of being a good parent. There's no steps to this. This is discipleship. And this is really the question for us. Why are you here? Why are we here? Why do we exist? And I've said this before. The second you believe, why doesn't God just go, yep, there's one more, and you're in heaven. And then the second you believe again, boom, and you're zapped up to heaven. Like you're here for a reason. And sometimes I think, I know, because I'm often there. I'm consumed with my own relationship with God. And hear me right here. That doesn't, it's not a bad thing. But what does Jesus command us in Matthew 28, 19? Go, make disciples. Make disciples. That's what we're here to do. He leaves the disciples. I mean, he could have just taken the disciples with them. But he left them. He says, go, make disciples. What does that mean? That means they got to they gotta do stuff. <laughs> They've got a responsibility. And Jesus, he's not the first one that, that talks about this. Like, this is throughout the Old Testament. We read the same thing, this idea that we have a responsibility to pass on, to pass on to the next generation our relationship with God, to, to pass on knowing the Lord, not the facts, not the Bible stories, not the, you know, the schedule of, you know, you go to church on Sundays because that's just what you should do. And, and man, if you're, a, if you're a teenager in here, middle school or high school or what, like, and that's not it. Please listen to me. Like, that's not it. It's a relationship with your creator. And so there's a culpability for us. In fact, it even says in, in, in um, Judges 2.11, what did they do? And, and here, before we get there, let me just, there is this notion that we're going to let our kids kind of do whatever. People will find their own way. God will bring them, and we just kind of, we just kind of kick back, and we're just kind of like these little like trophies that God has on the wall, and like people will walk by and be like, oh, what's that trophy for? And and you're like, oh, yeah, that person's saved, right? And, like, we just passively sit around and let, let God do his work. And, like, this is, this is great. But that's not what it says. I mean, it, it specifically says in verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That was what happened after the generation of the people who trusted God. How do we have these polar opposites? How do we have a generation? How do we have the, the, this, this world that, that has gotten so divided it's because they have misplaced hope who's responsible for that if you would like right if you've got your bible open right on the side of judges 2 10 psalm 78 and we're not going to read all of it but man it is a great psalm and it's um You know, and I don't know, like in, in my side notes, it says, tell the coming generation. And, and so there's this, it, it's, it's basically in, in line with this. It says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. What does it say there in, in verse 5? It says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers. What, what is he talking about there? We're going to jump around here real quick. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. That's what he's talking about. So the psalmist is pointing back to Deuteronomy going, like this, is, this idea of discipleship has always been there. This idea of us telling the next generation, whether these are your kids or your coworkers or your friends or whomever it is, it's telling them what God has done and what he's not, not just what he's done in history, but what he's done in your life. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? When we start telling others of how God has changed us, how God has opened our eyes, how God has revealed sin, how God has convicted us, how God has given us purpose, how God has given us hope. You guys, because that, that's what this world needs to know. They need to know where they find hope. We have the answer to everything that's going on. The real answer, right? It's hope. You have it. I mean, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you know where our hope is. And this is what this generation so desperately needs to know that, like, this is not about religious practices. This is not about picking away. And any way is good, but as long as you just pick one and do it right, man, that's, that's great. No. Everything else is empty. As everything else is work. Everything else is you trying to be a better person to earn the favor of God. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, right? That, that we are jacked up and there's nothing we're going to be able to do to fix ourselves. But that God came in flesh to fix it for us. Mercifully. Not because of anything we did. So there's, there's a couple different arguments to this. I've kind of alluded to one of them so far. The first one is that, well, God's sovereign. I don't, I don't need to focus on discipleship because, well, God will bring people to him, and some people he won't. And I'm just going to sit back. And if somebody walks in these doors and says they want to be a Christian and follow Christ, then I'll build a relationship with them, and, you know, and God will do whatever he does. I think we say that because we're lazy. I think we say that because we don't want to get into the emotional entanglement of relationships. But that's not what Jesus said. And that's not what the psalmist said. And that's not what God said after he gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. He said, teach them. The second argument we have is that we go, hey, listen, I, I, like, I don't want to bias my kids in any way. And so I'm going to teach them all the different options. And we're just, I'm just going to let them pick. So it's, it'll be way more authentic that way. Hear me right here. Um, if, if that's where you're operating from, then you don't know Jesus. There, there's more to it than that. If this is just a religion that you just picked, that, that's not Christ. That, that's not the gospel. Because it's not a religion. It's a relationship with God, our creator. It, it's, that, it's that God came to us. And, and I can say these things, and you can probably say these things too. But if, if Christ is your only hope, then he's the only hope for your kids. Right? If he's your only hope, if he's your source of peace and joy and comfort, then he's the only source of peace and joy and comfort for anybody. This isn't us being oppressive. This isn't us just arbitrarily picking a religion. By the grace of God, you happen to know who Christ is. 
But if he really is, is meaningful to us, how can we not? And then the third one is, man, and this is a growing one, the only reason you're a Christian is because you grew up in the West. Right? Like, you just, you grew up in America, so of course you're going to be a Christian. Or Costa Rica. <laughs> or I don't know. You guys probably grew up all sorts of different places. But you know what I mean? Like, like if, you're, if you're kind of in the West, right? South America, North America, like Europe, you're probably a Christian. Or at least your parents were a Christian or your grandparents were Christians. Which is ironic given where Jesus was born. And so it's, it's tied to culture. And we go, well, the only reason you're a Christian is because you're just in this Western culture. And, and if you weren't part of that Western culture, then, then you would probably have a different religion. And so this is the problem is you're just part of the culture. And so you can't see outside of that culture. And here's the reality is this is not our culture. <laughs> this wasn't written in our culture. The fact that this has pervaded the West, I, I can only attribute to the grace of God and that he has determined, for whatever reason, to allow the gospel to spread like wildfire in Europe and into the West. And, I mean, we can go into all sorts of historical reasons and the timing of, you know, Roman roads being built and aqueducts and all sorts of great things. But the point is, is that, that God saw fit to spread the gospel like wildfire. It's beyond culture. And if you read, if you read it, you see that it has nothing to do with culture. And so don't allow these things to be confused because right now we actually feel a little bit embarrassed, I think, to say that our faith is the only source of hope. I think we feel like there's a growing... Uh, uh, condemnation on others when we say that. But Jesus didn't feel that way. You see, and so, so the point of our lives is not that we ought to just, you know, let things just develop. Like, we are called and commanded to make disciples. And look at what it says in Psalm 78, 7. There's a reason there's a reason. It's so that they should set their hope in God. I was 15 years old when I got baptized. I was probably 20 years old when I became like a follower of Christ. Like, you know, whatever. I don't know how you guys all, grew, you know, came to Christ and all of this, but some, it's a very clear delineation. It was on this day for me. It was not, but, you know, I, I got baptized uh, when I was 15 and then, you know, Life was still messy and stuff. I know life is, continues to be messy, but, but I would say it was probably somewhere about five years later that I was like, okay, like, this is, I'm a follower of Christ. Like, I, I want to follow Christ. And so I say that because that means that there was 20 years in my life that I didn't. And there were 20 years of my life that I don't even know, I don't remember where I was placing my hope. But I know where it wasn't. It wasn't in Christ. And so that's the question for us. Like, if I can give to my kids or to others, like, and tell them, like, here's the hope. Here's where you find it. It's in Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. Well, then, man, I just saved him 20 years. <laughs> Some of you maybe still be struggling with this. Some of you didn't come to faith until 30, 35, 40 years old. And so we as, as believers and as followers of Christ who have and know the gospel, man, like, I, I have a gift for you. It's the good news of Jesus. You're like, you don't have to waste the rest of your life trying to find hope in material things and in wealth and in comfort and in politicians and in your wife or your husband or in your kids. Like That's not where your hope is. Your hope is in Christ. I can tell you that now. I can equip you with that now because that's the loving thing to do. And so that, that's disciple making. That's the problem here. That's what, that's what, whatever that generation did, they didn't do that. And because their kids, the next generation grew up and they just walked away. And so the question for us this morning then is, 
how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we keep our hope from being a product? Right? Because, I mean, that's, that's what's the problem right now, right? Is, is your hope, my hope, is being sold and advertised and marketed and bought. And, and I mean, old, in old times, it was just via commercials uh, on TV. And now it's, it's all over the place. And, and everybody's trying to say, hey, you should put your hope here. You should put your hope here. You should put your hope here. And this is what our kids, this is what everybody is dealing with. This is what the world is dealing with. And so they just, they just have to pick one. And so how, how do we effectively make disciples? How do we effectively say in the, in the sea of all these options, in the sea of all this hope and false hope, how do we say this one right here, this is Christ, and this is your real hope? How do we do that? Turn back over to Deuteronomy 4.9. This is a great verse. It says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. What does he say there? Keep your soul diligently. Are we? Because there's, there's, a, there's a connection here. There's a little train of thought here, right? Keep your soul diligently so that you don't forget the things that you have seen, the things that God has done in your life. Don't forget about those things. We need to be marking these things, writing these things down, telling them to our kids, telling them to our friends and our family and going, this is what God did in my life. Whether you believe it or not, this is what I think he did in my life. Because nobody can, nobody can say that he didn't. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean... God gave me a great story a year and a half ago. I'm like, listen, I didn't do anything. And yet God saw fit to rescue me, right? And I, I have to, and I've written this down because I'm like, look at, look at what happened. Look at these series of things that happened that, that are only, can only be answered by sovereignty. Whether you believe that there were medical reasons for, for me staying alive, whatever, but all the things, like the fact that there were two guys there to dig me out of a pool at the right time that just showed up early, <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of these things. And so when we say this, we go, don't forget, because he says, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. And look at what it says next. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. This isn't, this isn't temporary, you guys. What happens when we don't keep our soul diligently? We forget, and then what happens? It leaves our heart. All the days of my life. Like, this is not, this is significant, you guys. This is, this is what he's talking about, because what's in our heart is what we care about. What's in our heart is what we prioritize. What's in our heart is what we're going to talk about. And if we're not keeping our soul diligently, if we're not trying to remember what God has done in our lives and in the lives of those around us so that we can speak these things, we're going to stop caring about these things. And when we stop caring about these things, we stop making disciples. That's it. There's, there's no 12-step plan of discipleship making, you guys. Keep your soul diligently. How do we do that? Stay close to God. Care about the things that God cares about. And remember. Remember what he has done. Treasure these things in our hearts. Because it's only when we do that that it's going to flow out of our mouths. And that's authenticity. That's being genuine. You guys, I, I, I've said this to a few of you guys, like, and I think, I don't know, it's probably worth saying, but the thing that I am the most afraid of is that 
Um, pastor's kids don't have a good... The statistics aren't good. And that scares me. Um... Because I never really wanted to do this. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah. Hopefully you know the story, so don't. <laughs> um, I love doing it, but I'm, I'm scared. And so when I read the story of Eli and his sons, I go, man. And I say that because that's not unique well, I think those statistics are for a different set of circumstances. I pray to God that they are. I keep telling my kids, I'm a fighter pilot, I'm a fighter pilot, I'm not a pastor. I'm, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> How ironic is that? You know, and, and I think, but, but this, this stress, this, this, this is why authenticity is so important. This is why I want my kids to know, like, like, this is where I place my hope. This isn't just where I, I go and talk on a Sunday morning. This is where my hope is. And when, when things get rough and when horrible situations develop, that's where I go. And that's where we go. And that's how we communicate to the world where our hope is. Not, not in words. Maybe in words. You're not going to have a... a theological argument, probably, and somebody's going to go, you know what, you're right. It's probably not going to happen. It's because it's about how it affects you and your life and where you can point back to why Christ is your hope, why the good news of Jesus Christ is really, really good news because he solves the problems in our marriages. He solves the problems, the medical problems that we're going through. The, not, that, not that there's going to be a miraculous solution to these things, but that in these things we have peace. And if we don't have peace, if you are part of this world that's, that's divided and angry and frustrated and you're looking for hope, I, I would just ask that you keep your soul diligently. The more angry you become, the more you need to pour into this. The more time you need to spend on your knees, the more frustrated, the more times you start putting your hope in other people or things or wealth or your job or your family or your health point of this because Christ is our only hope let me pray